All right. Welcome, everybody, to another Barnyards and Backyards live show. I am Jeremiah Vardaman. I'm with the University of Wyoming Extension. I'm an extension educator up in Powell, Wyoming. Today, we have a great presentation, but before we get to that, we got a few introductions, and then we're going to go through some, some ground rules of how you can interact and bring your questions forward into this, this live show. Uh, today, my co-host, we're switching things up again. Uh, Brian Sabati, he is our extension educator down in Laramie. Good morning, Brian. Hey there. How are you guys today? Glad to have you on, bud. Um, right. Also, we have Jenny Thompson. You won't see her, but you will probably hear her from time to time. She's behind the Barnyards and Backyards logo. And as you know, she keeps us on track and also connected and functioning. So she does all the behind the scenes things. We really appreciate everything you do, Jenny. Today, we are talking about tips and tricks to managing high tunnels and growing in high tunnels and extended season spaces, right? So sure. today, our, our guest is Jeff Edwards. Good morning, Jeff. How are we doing? I'm great, Jeremiah. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to have me uh, on this program today. Yeah, one time. Only once, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but before we get to our presentation, we want to go through the ground rules for you guys. If you've never joined us, uh, if you're on Zoom, if you roll your mouse across the bottom, there is a chat box or chat window and then a Q&A box or window. If you want to click on those, you can type your questions in and Brian and I will be monitoring those and bring those questions into the conversation when they kind of fit within the flow. So please do bring that. For those of you on Facebook Live, uh, put your questions in the comments. A uh, box and uh, Jenny will bring those forward to us and Brian and I will bring those in to Jeff and, and get the questions you want to know answered. That's why we're doing this here is for you and, and bringing information to you. Without further ado, let's turn it over to you, Jeff, and let's get started. Okay, thank you, Jeremiah. Thank you, Brian. And uh, again, happy to be here and talk about uh, season extenders. Um, Jeremiah, you alluded to it's uh, hoop houses and high tunnels, but it's it's more than that, right? So it's uh, low tunnels. And um, uh, before we actually started doing enclosed space production, it also includes things like, hey, it's going to freeze tonight. Let's go throw the blankets outside on, uh, on our garden to make sure that they uh, make it a few more days. So it, we're going to talk about all those things today. Uh, Brian is... Um, I might be knowledgeable about high tunnels and hoop houses. Brian is very knowledgeable about low tunnels and uh, modifying spaces and those types of things. Uh, so we're just going to have a conversation today and talk about the benefits of enclosed space production. So let me share my screen and we'll jump into the program. We'll cover everything and just have a have a good time doing it, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> No pun intended. No pun intended. Cover everything. <laughs> exactly. All right. So um, uh, I told these guys this was a uh, presentation that I recycled from a long time ago, and I, uh, I was reviewing it. And um, uh, it, it still is pertinent today, particularly for this, uh, for our topic. Um, but uh, I've been working in and around hoop houses and high tunnels since about 2009. Uh, and then um, I'm trying to think, uh, 2019, we started building geodesic domes around the state and showing people how to use those as well. Uh, Brian, how long have you been uh, protecting your crops with low tunnels? Yeah, I, you're saying that I'm having to think. Um, probably <laughs> right around 2012, so a little over 10 years. Okay, put you on the spot, didn't I? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, okay. Yeah. So what are, what are season extenders? Uh, they're passive structures that require no additional energy inputs. Can you have additional energy inputs? Sure. Uh, if you want to figure out how to heat them, you can. Uh, if you want to figure out how to vent them uh, using energy, you can. But you might be surprised at how productive your space can be even throughout the cold months uh, without additional energy inputs. And again, they are structures that protect crops from highly are, are highly variable growing conditions. Um, just between yesterday and today, right? I don't know. Uh, southeastern Wyoming, um, from Torrington to Laramie, it was nearly 70 degrees yesterday. 
And this morning in Torrington, there was snow on the ground. So that's what we're talking about, that highly variable weather that Wyoming is notorious for. Uh, well, and especially, especially things like hail, right? Yeah. yeah. So if you can get through a one incident of hail, you can be very productive or, or a, a late freeze, right? So up here in Powell uh, in 2020, we froze September 9th. But it warmed up and was beautiful for another two and a half months after that. So if you can right. just get through that less than 24 hours cold snap, you're good. Yes. And, and these structures will do that. Uh, and what we're talking about mainly is uh, planting earlier and harvesting later, right? So you're extending that growing season. And growing season around Wyoming is highly variable. In, in the Torrington area, we have a solid 100 days of uh, growing time where Brian in Laramie, what, you know, 85, if you're lucky. Yeah. I mean, 60. <laughs> I figure about 90 days of a frost free period. But I think, yeah. I think going back to what you're talking about is those highs and lows is, you know, this can really help kind of buffer out those big temperature swings and things like that, that are so important. So, um, and for folks in folks in Pinedale, I think they have a negative summer right right yeah. <laughs> things like that but yeah if we can if we can figure out a way to overcome these weird little weather th patterns that we have uh then it helps with production um and doing these types of structures it can allow you to produce throughout the winter can you produce things like tomatoes throughout the winter probably not but if you're selective about the crops that you plant uh, particularly greens or coal crops, you might be able to get them through the winter. And uh, it's really nice to have a guard or have a fresh greens in February and March uh, that you've grown. So, so, in like certain, so in certain parts of Wyoming with these season extensions, we can possibly grow longer uh, varieties, right? Yes. Um, so, right. If, if we typically know how long our grow time is we're we're if we're growing outside we're targeting seeds that will mature in 100 days or or, or less or less <laughs> yeah um and these uh structures would allow you to pick and choose some things that ha might have longer uh requirements for growth so uh i spoke with a guy yesterday in laramie uh who wants to grow his own loofah sponges hmm the plants for the, the growing days for loofah sponges, it's 120. So there's no way he's going to be able to grow them in Laramie without some type of structure. Uh, so uh, those are the types of things that we're kind of looking out for, right? Uh, but so what are season extenders? For me, it's hoop houses and high tunnels, which are equivalent terms. Uh, and those structures are things that you can walk into. Uh, so this structure that's the image behind me or Jeremiah, uh, that it's large enough that you can walk in, you can move equipment in and out of those types of things. And then uh, uh, there's hybrid structures uh, with geodomes and high tunnels. And that is actually the structure that, it, that is behind me and my image. Uh, that is a geo tunnel. And then behind Brian in his image, it's a low tunnel structure. And then we, we can also go uh, and define it a little more as individual plant protection. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's as simple as blankets on your crops, sailor caps, and I'm probably going to mispronounce this, but cloches, cloches. Uh, I, I don't have any French, so uh, it's something like that. Um, and then there's walls of water and those types of things. Anything that we can place around those plants or protect them from the outside elements, you're going to extend that season one way or another. And so this is just a, you know, it's a collage of different types of structures that we've been involved with around the state. Uh, the one in the upper left, that was a, a structure that was in Goshen County, uh, really large high tunnel for the time. It was um, uh, uh, made out of PVC pipe and, and uh, I think it was 70 by 23 or something like that. Um, and a lot of the information that I'm sharing with you from today will be uh, was in that particular structure. Um, and then, uh, of course, the low tunnel in the bottom left and then uh, uh, geodomes, uh, something that we've been experimenting with here in the last five years. 
Inside these structures, temper, temperature regulation is critical, um, particularly in the summer. You've got to figure out a way to vent them because um, what happens if you don't have a vent, uh, they can easily get up to 140 degrees, 150 degrees. Uh, and if you're not prepared, if you're not there, uh, you can make salsa in your high tunnel without doing it intentionally. Uh, you basically will cook everything. Uh, plants generally shut down production anytime after uh, 95 degrees. Is it 85 or 95? 95. Yeah. Um, and so, stressing. yeah, anything hotter than that, they'll start to wilt and die and burn up. And yeah, great. Um, so on these structures, you need to have roll-up sides. You need to have, uh, sometimes we've installed uh, solar-powered attic vents just because they move more air. Uh, and uh, then uh, powered louvered vents, which the power, it's a little shock absorber that's filled with wax that opens up the louver as it gets to 70 degrees. Um, and then the flip side of that, if you plan on producing through the winter, uh, and I might mention this a couple of times, whatever the outside temperature is, the outside nighttime temperature, that will be the inside nighttime temperature. So uh, you may need to provide additional covering. So uh, inside a hoop house, you can put another, you can put load tunnels, um, you can cover things with blankets. Uh, uh, this image on the bottom here, this is an insulated blanket that we used, uh, worked really well. So we had floating row covers and then we put these insulated blankets over the top. And the other thing to consider is that if you have multiple cloudy days, fortunately, we have a lot of sunny days in Wyoming, right? Uh, and anytime the sun's out, that structure is collecting radiant energy. Um, uh, but if you have multiple cloudy days, you definitely have to th keep things covered uh, in order to keep them uh, alive through the winter. Um, Jeff, before you jump yeah. on. Go. I just wanted to clarify some stuff, and you said it already before, but we're talking about passive systems. Yep. Right? And yep. so whatever the low time temperature is for the day or night, wherever that lowest temperature is within that time period, that's what your structure is going to be experiencing. And so that's where that protection comes in, right? Correct. Yes. One question I have for you on the venting. Where does that venting, does it matter where that's put within the structure? Does it need to be down at the base of the plants? Does it need to be at the highest peak of the structure? What Does that matter? Yeah, so uh, the hoop house designs that we had, this one, this image that's on the top, um, most of the commercially available kits, the, the roll-up sides start from the bottom of the structure and then roll up to, I don't know, six feet high and allow breezes to blow through and things like that. Um, we could have done that on these types of structures, but uh, we started it higher and then rolled it up higher uh, to try to get so that the, the heat is going to build up in the peak of whatever the structure is. Um, and so having roll up sides roll up higher will allow more of that heat to escape in the summertime. Um, and also having this, this base around the bottom. If you're rolling up the structure early in the spring to try to help vent, you're preventing any cool breezes that might be blowing across on those new tender plants. Uh, and you're also preventing any wildlife from getting in, right? So, yep. uh, you know, cats, dogs, deer. <laughs> Rabbits. Rabbits. All the above, right? Uh, rodents, yeah. Um, so uh, we found that it was really helpful to start the roll-up side a little bit higher up the structure. And that looks like it's about like three feet up is the sidewall, maybe. Yep. Yep. It's about three feet, three to four feet. And um, that'd be sufficient. And then to be able to roll it up as high as you possibly could. Yep. Cool. Okay. Yep. Good questions. Um, so the other aspect of this is, you know, you have the structure. Um, I wouldn't recommend taking the cover off in the wintertime to try to collect moisture excuse me, traditionally we don't have enough winter <laughs> winter moisture to justify that. Now, the folks in Rollins this year might disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and other places around the state. Uh, but 
um, you really have to have some type of watering system in place. Uh, I recommend using a frost-free hydrant, something with a timer on it, um, and drip lines, and make sure that you water daily because that's the only moisture that these structures will receive. Uh, and that's in the summertime. Wintertime, again, you're probably going to want to have a frost-free hydrant on the inside of the structure, uh, but make sure it's unhooked at night because it will freeze up uh, and possibly destroy that hydrant. Um, water needs in the wintertime are a little bit different. Uh, if you water really good in October, November, once maybe, you can probably get to January before you need to water again. It's it's kind of uh, it's kind of counterintuitive, but the ground starts to freeze, uh, the plants aren't growing as quickly, their water requirements aren't as much. So um, you really don't need to water a whole lot in the winter time. But what you need to do is be managing those additional coverings. Um, but the idea is in the winter time, like you said, that frost-free hydrant, you want to disconnect that so it will drain back below ground and be frost frost free hydrant again right, right. or else you'll rupture the hydrant and, and ruin your water supply yes yes uh and you don't want to do that <laughs> no because then you got to dig that up in the middle of the winter <laughs> I, i've replaced enough of those that i don't want to do that again <laughs> no you only have to highly, do it once <laughs> highly encouraged right <laughs> yeah. yeah hey jeff so i want to go back to watering for just a second sure um so we're talking about venting and being kind to, to new plants as they're establishing. I've really noticed with low tunnels and other structures I've used, the water savings that I have with these type of structures. Um, you know, you don't have wind that's constantly going over plants, drying them out, um, but also just helps retain some of that moisture that, that gets in there. Do you kind of notice the same thing with most of your high tunnels as well? You maybe have a little bit of water savings as compared to growing outside of them, or is it kind of... Well, uh, it's it's more efficient with drip lines, right? Um, but I haven't I haven't measured the difference between using drip and not using drip. I can only assume that it's more efficient. Um, in my high tunnel, I have a twenty. Or excuse me, I have a thirty by thirty two structure, uh, and I water everywhere where my drip lines are for thirty minutes a day. Um, and early on, early on because you're germinating things, you don't necessarily need to do that. You can hit them with a sprinkler, with a hand wand or something to try to get them to germinate. Um, and that's sufficient. Uh, one of the questions that I get um, is, you know, how much work does a high tunnel take or how much work is a low tunnel, right? <laughs> well, it isn't, <laughs> go ahead, Jeremiah. Well, I was gonna say, that's me. Oh right? yeah, I'm lazy. I yeah. don't want more work. <laughs> yeah. So in my mind, it isn't any more work to have one of these structures. Uh, you know, there's some different maintenance things that you do, but uh, uh, if you have something like this, you're going to be out there looking through it practically every day, just because it's kind of a curiosity, right? Uh, and if you see weeds, you're going to pull them. Um, and after several years of production, if you're not introducing new soil, uh, you will probably not be pulling weeds anymore. Um, and so uh, the, the real, to me, the producing in the wintertime is more work than it is in the summertime, just because you got to be aware of the weather. And if it get if it's going to get cold, you need to cover stuff and you probably need to cover stuff every night. Uh, so, you know, it just depends on how far you want to go into the season uh, to produce. It can be done it'll be more work in the winter time less watering but more work and i think there's probably is less work with a high tunnel or a geodome or something bigger than some of the low tunnel type structures right yes yeah, um, so it, I mean, and it all ha it all has to do with the air volume that's in there right so uh if you're capturing more warm air uh in a high tunnel or hoop house that it, that exchange rate is less so that you're keeping that warm air in that structure longer yeah Yep. Ready to move on? We're ready. We'll okay. stop asking all these questions. That's okay. <laughs> questions are good. Uh, one another question I get is how early can I plant? And I'm I'm going to give you the typical extension answer. It depends. It depends on where you live. It depends on what kind of structure you have. It depends on what type of winter you have had. Um, so for me, typically in Goshen County, 
I start get, getting kind of antsy about planting around the spring solstice. So what is that, the 20th of March, right? Um, but, uh, and, and usually my coal crops, I've usually got them planted, uh, you know, 10 days within this, the spring solstice. Um, this year, however, just because we've had more highly variable cooler temperatures, we haven't gotten really excited about it. I mean, we've done some cleanup in our high tunnel, but we haven't really planted anything, uh, anything new. Um, I, other years in the past, I've planted sweet corn the 1st of April. Now, Brian, I wouldn't recommend planting sweet corn in the Laramie area in a high tunnel the 1st of April. <laughs> right, exactly. That's one of those that really depends, right? Where you live. It, and what yeah. yeah, and so, you know, you're going to get, it, as long as the, the soil temperature is consistently 40 degrees, you're going to start to get plants that will germinate, but you will still need to cover them to try to get them through those frost days. Uh, to try to get them to the normal frost-free date. Um, so it, it's, it's situational. It just kind of depends on where you are. And there's a lot of things to think about. Is it, is it more to worry about than a traditional garden? Probably not. I think working in a high tunnel is probably one of the most therapeutic things you can probably do in the springtime. It's usually nice and warm in there. Uh, the wind's not blowing on you. It's a great place to spend some time. <clears throat> well, and even in the winter time, right? Those nice yeah. sunny days, they're only maybe 30 degrees outside or 40 degrees outside in the winter, but inside the structure, it feels warm. It can be a little oasis. And if you have something green to go look at, it's all the better. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and Jeff, I've, I've asked you this question for myself personally on some things, but what's a good way to actually measure that temperature in there? Um, do you have any uh, that? Yeah, yeah, so... Um, and, and maybe... Uh, well, Air and soil. Yeah. Okay. So um, I've got some images that we'll get to uh, to try to show that. So corner me when we get to those things, and and we can we can demonstrate that. But there are a lot of um, uh, internet ready devices that you can put out into the into these structures and monitor air temperature, soil temperature. It's going to be a, a just a soil temperature probe that you put in and just let it sit and then when you're out there you go check it out right okay, but perfect. uh these are some data some images that i collected way back when we first started doing this uh and that's why i said i was cheating a little when i put this presentation together um but uh it it still is relevant for today right so this is gillette uh we looked up the elevation of gillette earlier it's 4500 feet yes about right so yes I, you know in October, the first part of October, which I'm guessing by the end, middle of September, maybe, uh, would be the last frost-free date in Gillette. <clears throat> but inside their high tunnel that we put up, uh, they still had tomatoes blooming and cold crops growing and those types of things in October. So uh, yeah, you can, you can produce a lot of stuff uh, in further into the season. Uh, myself personally, we had uh, tomatoes that we uh, were still growing into November. We harvested the green ones and we uh, uh, and the, those that were turning. And I think we finally ate the last one in January this year. So uh, you're, we're, we're still able to get production uh, far into the season uh, and enjoy those fresh produce. Um, this is a Torrington project that we did same same year. This is 45 days past normal production outside. So we've already had a killing frost outside. Um, and look, we've got snow on the ground, right? Uh, temperature when we went out there was 48 degrees, 70% um, humidity. So you can, you can put a temp, you can do an electronic temperature probe, those types of things out there to manage it if you don't wanna walk out into it. Um, uh, but just a simple, temperature and humidity gauge that you can post out there someplace and walk out there and check it. Uh, so that, you're talking ambient with the, the picture in the lower right yep. corner, just to yep. be clear, yep. right? Yep. Ambient yep. temperature, the temperature, the air temperature walking through. Yes. <laughs> yep. Uh, and so, you know, this is that structure. And just to show you in the lower left-hand corner, um, 
we do have low tunnels and other things covered uh, uh, that we are trying to protect, right? So, and we're using a bunch of different things to do that. Uh, but the greens, you know, there's your favorite, Brian, kale. Um, so you had to put that in there for me. Don't worry. I did. Jeff. I specifically. Yeah. We'll, get, we'll get the beets for you. I know you have pictures of those. Okay. So. Yeah, exactly. No, I skipped the beets. <laughs> but what you're pointing out, Jeff, and I'm probably jumping ahead on you, but it, it's crop selection that also benefits this. Right. You know, you can't, again, as I mentioned, you can't grow tomatoes and sweet corn and things like that in through the winter. You have to be really selective. Uh, I hate to bring it up, Brian, but kale will survive. Um, coal, uh, other coal crop type plants will also survive and produce. And there are a lot of different greens that are available uh, that will survive the winter and make a nice harvestable garden or a harvestable salad for you. Um, yeah, so a lot of things out there. Um, again, we're 45 days out. Oh, Jenny wanted to, uh, wanted to know maybe when we planted these types of things and uh, to try to get them to continue through the winter. And my best guess, because I can't remember 2010 that well, uh, <laughs> it was, we probably planted them in the end of July or sometime in August to try to get them to the stage that we felt that we could overwinter them. However, um, this low tunnel inside the high tunnel, we planted it um, in August. Uh, and so things are germinating and we're hopeful that we can be productive throughout the winter with this low tunnel, right? So Jeff, so, do, you, do you measure your soil temperature as well or are you only concerned about the ambient temperature? Yes, uh, we did not. I think um, if I remember correctly, we had some uh, uh, soil temperature probes here, but I don't recall what happened to the data. <laughs> But you know, again, if, if it's freezing outside, the raised beds could potentially freeze and that's gonna slow down growth. And so on those warm days, we have everything uncovered. We're trying to collect as much ambient warmth as we possibly can. And then before it gets dark on us again, we'll go in and cover it up. And so that kind of keeps that raised bed uh, warmer to allow these things to continue to grow slowly. If but some if somebody was wanting to measure their soil temperature, how deep do you go in the soil to measure? I would only go, I wouldn't go more than two inches deep. Uh, I would really only keep it about an inch deep for our crops and, and have an idea of what, of what that is. And I, I have a really poor image of my soil temperature probe and, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but again, you know, we're 45 days out. Oh, there's that picture of beets. Sorry, Brian. There I it failed. is. I did. You knew they were in there. Yep. Um, yeah. So, you know, and and look at the size of the leaves on those beans. They're just absolutely huge, right? They're, oh, they're so huge. Things, things are growing really well in there. Um, uh, again, by the end of the time that we were working that particular day, it got up to 52. The humidity <laughs> dropped a little bit. Uh, and then at night, we went back in and covered things up. Um, and so we're still harvesting just harvesting different things out there. The root crops are growing. Um, 65 days past production. Uh, and, you know, this is really unheard of unless you have a structure like this. Um, look at how well those things underneath that low tunnel in there are still growing. Slowly, you know, granted it's, it's slow, the, their growth is slow, but they're still growing. They haven't died because it's been cold. So if I understand that right, Jeff, right, the, they're slowing down because the temperature, right? But also because of photo period. Photo period, yes, day length, right? Yep, how many yep. how many hours of day length do we get it? It it gets light at eight o'clock in the morning and dark at four thirty. <laughs> so, you know, they it, it so it really becomes important to uh, pull your covers off when the, when we have sunny days and kind of get things warmed up and going again. And and they are only uh, growing. Uh, during that short time. Uh, so again, you know, broccoli and spinach and those types of things are doing well, 65 days out. Okay, uh, hold, hold on, Jeff. A question for Brian for your low tunnel. So this is, this is again, a, a geodesic dome or a high tunnel, correct? Yes. 
with cover on it inside, like row covers or, or low tunnels inside. Correct. So Brian, with a low tunnel, how how far past the growing season can we extend that with just a low tunnel, not a big structure like what Jeff's talking about? Um, again, the extension uh, answer of it depends, but I have had um, <clears throat> beets and carrots um, still doing their thing, look decent, maybe a little bit wilty. Um, some towards the touching the outside edges that maybe had some burn, but um, in the right year, I've still been harvesting until the first week of November in Laramie. So, and yeah. that would be forty-five days past the killing frost, or or thirty. Yeah, probably forty-five, maybe even a little bit longer. Yeah. So, yeah, almost close to sixty. I'd put it closer to like fifty, fifty-five. For okay. you know, that's not every that's not every year. So, right. Yeah. It wouldn't probably be this year, would it? Uh, so, Jeff, not have been, no, no. so we have a question uh, from one of our viewers. Rick asks, don't you put a vacuum break on your hydrants, basically to break that seal? So the hydrants at the bottom. So um, a vacuum break on your hydrants. Uh, no. Uh, when you turn it off, it drains. If you break the seal with the hose. If you break the seal with the hose and you turn it off, right? Yep. It back drains down to the bottom. Yep. That's what I am not familiar with a vacuum break on the hydrant, but you got to break that seal to allow that water to go back down into the hydrant. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not familiar with a with that either. Okay. A vacuum break. Uh, Jenny, just for everybody's information, Jenny has thrown into the chat box a link for an article on things to consider when growing through the season, uh, through the winter season, and then also particularly what uh, crops are really cold hardy and do well in that. So with that, let's keep going. Okay, so the things that we produced in December in that particular location was spinach, Swiss chard, sugar snap peas, radishes, turnips, uh, and broccoli. Um, so that's really, I mean, that is really uncommon uh, and, and awesome that we can do that um hold on jeff got another question for you okay so it, it pertains right to what you're talking about but the question is from phil and ann how worthwhile is it to have a double wall of plastic on the high tunnel can a single wall be changed to a double wall with a fan that blows air in between the layers yeah so um uh what you're talking about is providing a insulative cell right uh, you are increasing your R value of your plastic. So um, uh, early on, we did some research looking at different means to capture heat. And, and uh, uh, we looked at um, water barrels painted black, double insulating or insulating the, uh, the base structure, and then double plasticking, if that's a correct word or not, um, the, the structure. Uh, and um, on ours, we did not blow air, but we used batten straps to create that air pillow between the cells of the ribs. Um, and so if you can get more than three inches of a space, you're increasing your R value. And what we found is that um, by doubling the plastic, you actually took longer for the plants to, or for the structure to cool off in the evening, and it and it protected it protected the plants a little bit better. So double plastic, using double plastic, uh, is actually the best way to probably protect your plants if you're doing a passive system. Did that answer the question? Yeah, so it's an, an insulation factor, right? The more insulation factor you can put on the structure, the longer the heat will stay within the structure. But if I understand it correctly, you still get down to that lowest temperature for the daytime. Yeah, it just takes longer. Supplemental to get there. heat. It just takes longer to get there. Yeah. Right. Um, so the literature uh, suggests that for each layer of plastic, you increase your USDA growth zone by one which basically adds 30 days on either end, right? Um, now, 
much of the research that has been done on hoop houses and high tunnels is in places that are cool and cloudy in the wintertime, uh, cool, cloudy, overcast. So they don't have the sunny days like we do. So uh, it, that sun is really important to be able to capture that heat as it collects inside of that structure during the day. Uh, okay, so again, continuing on, we're 95 days out from uh, normal field production. And it's 68 degrees out there, right? In your high tunnel, uh, humidity starts to drop as we go through the course of the winter. <clears throat> um, your structure might be difficult to get into because there was a snow drift in front of it. <laughs> um, but, and things are still producing, right? So there's still greens available. There's broccoli still growing. Things are looking a little tough, but uh, if you're hungry, right? Uh, when you're hungry, you can still eat them. Uh, things in the ground are still doing great, still producing. Uh, and look at that bed, how well it has germinated um, and grown into January. Um, so things continue to grow if they're protected. Right? I would harvest that. That'd make a, yeah, nice, looks salad. Good. That'd make a nice salad in January. Looks good to me, yeah. <laughs> okay, and to shift gears a little bit more recently um, in uh, Goshen County, uh, you know, I'm still doing this. I'm, I'm producing in our own high tunnel throughout the winter. Uh, greens are easy to grow. Uh, these were planted in late August. And we have these cloches, cloches, whatever that term is. <clears throat> you all know what I'm talking about. Uh, that um, we, we're inside the high tunnel. We put these over the top of it. That's the only protection that we provide. Uh, we leave them on during the day, we leave them on at nighttime, and, you know, we're getting greens to grow. Uh, so um, that lazy thing that you talked about, Jeremiah, this is a really easy way to keep things going in the wintertime. Um, but in February, we harvested a salad, fresh salad out of the high tunnel. Uh, and in March, we've had two harvests. So um, if you can get things to survive through those really cold, cloudy days, you will be able to have fresh greens or, or uh, fresh produce, okay? Some of the other things that we have over wintering in ours is uh, uh, strawberries. This was just last weekend. Uh, when it went through and cleaned our strawberry bed out, cleaned out all the dead leaves. Uh, I have a, oh yeah. So it was 39 degrees outside and it was 90 inside the, the high tunnel that day because it was a really nice sunny day. The really freaky thing is when you're out there and a cloud happens to go by, you can definitely tell that the temperature drops, right? So uh, it was 90 degrees, cloud to go by, it had dropped to 70. And so a really highly flexible in temperature and things like that. Um, I have a question for you, Jeff, on that. Yep. So go if ahead. you're using those automated louvers that you talked about, those vents that you put in the roof, if you hit a day like this where it hits 90 degrees, is that registering the temperature inside the structure to open those louvers or is it using the outside temperature? Yeah, so the, the louver opener, the little shock, the wax filled shock thing is actually inside the structure. So when the temperature inside hits 70, they open up and they were open this day. Yeah, I've got two, I've got two small ones in the peak of my structure in addition to roll up sides. Do you know what temperature they they trigger at? 70 degrees. 70. Wow. Yep. Yep. Um, and so some things to remember when we're when we're producing. They're passive structures, right? So it's really important to realize that the outside overnight temperature is what the inside overnight temperature will be at some point. Okay. It might not be right away, but it will get cold. Um, and then it's really important if you're doing winter production to capture heat during the day, figure out how to trap it somehow, additional layers, um, uh, putting walls of water around your plants, um, those types of things, and then try to get them through whatever cold snap you might have. And if it's cloudy for multiple days, leave the covers on. Your plants will live. Uh, it's just, you're just protecting them. All right, 
Last thing I'm going to touch on really quickly are pest issues. Um, you will have them. Uh, things happen, right? Uh, there will be arthropod pests, and rodents really love these structures. Uh, I don't know, Brian, if you've found this in your high tunnels or in your low tunnels or not, but it's nice and warm in there. Rodents love it. Uh, and um, I, this uh, image is of a bushy-tailed uh, wood rat, otherwise known as a pack rat. And uh, I have a client that I've worked with in um, encampment. And every year she says, oh, the, the pack rats are back. And she, uh, ha they, sit, they actually climb into her broccoli plants and harvest the, they'll sit in the, in the broccoli and harvest the heads out. So that's why uh, you do not plant broccoli. hundred <laughs> percent. It attracts vermin. <laughs> and, and Jeremiah, I know how much you love broccoli. So you're, 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 you're a team rodent there, aren't you? I know. Totally. <laughs> you got to help them too. Yeah, exactly. Um, but you know, you will have pests. Uh, and a couple of weeks ago, was it three weeks ago, we had a, a uh, insect specific program uh, for controlling in your garden in high tunnels. So uh, I'd recommend that you take a look at that and try to figure things out. Uh, there's a lot of literature out there. I'm sure Jenny's throwing up some links uh, for some of those things. Uh, but there's been some previous B&B &B, um, programs on them. It's just that if you have problems, you have to respond quickly. Uh, so in Goshen County in 2010, we made it through the full year, right? We were produced all year round, and then we continued on into 2011. Well, we would have made it through 2011, but we had a really bad aphid infestation. And we decided in February of 20, February of 2011, yeah, I think I got my dates right, uh, that let's pull everything close the high tunnel uh, down and not be producing and try to get this aphid problem under control. So, you know, there's things that you're gonna have to do uh, to try to manage things. Um, so on that, Jeff, right? So if you are growing year round, you don't get the natural breaks in terms of the extreme heat or extreme cold to break those pest cycles to give you benefit. That's what you're talking about. Well, um, yes, but if you have, actively living plant material through the winter and you start into the winter and you have plant pests, particularly aphids, they're probably the ones that are going to survive the winter temperatures. Um, they will survive in oh, their little colonies and be, uh, they'll make it through the winter. So, yep. okay. Yeah. Okay. Just um, got to control them. Yeah, so I mean, basically we're talking about these simple structures that can be utilized to extend Wyoming's growing season and can extend it significantly, right? Uh, you can help feed your family, uh, increase market availability of local food. And, you know, if you go big enough, you can also help uh, provide alternative income for uh, many producers if you choose to do so. So one of the last questions that Jenny had for me was, uh, how do I get these things? You know, there are commercial kits available, right? Um, and maybe I should start on the bottom list of the commercial kits. There are grants available from NRCS uh, for hoop houses and high tunnels. Uh, if you want to investigate these types of structures, you can go to them and ask them what funding is available. Um, the, some of the kits that are out there can be really expensive. Uh, and if they're covered by traditional greenhouse film, if you live in an area that's prone to have hail, uh, which is what, 90% of Wyoming, um, traditional greenhouse film will probably only last one or two years. Uh, and if you look on the right-hand side of this, we recommend using a woven polyethylene product. There's a manufacturer in um, uh, Ponchatoula, Louisiana that we have been using as a supplier but there's other sources out there too. Uh, A.M. Leonard has theirs, dripworks.com uh, has theirs. So there's other places you can purchase this material um, and it's really tough. Uh, it tolerates hail. If hail happens to poke through it, it won't run or rip uh, and you can patch it with um, Gorilla Tape or something along that line, right? 
and it's uh, opaque looking, right? It's not clear. You can't see through it. Yeah, you, it has it has about 85% light transmittance through it. Uh, and it's kind of a weird product because when you are inside a high tunnel or hoop house that has that's covered with that product, uh, there's no there's no shade, right? So light's coming in and it's bouncing around it in all directions, and there's no there's no shade source. So uh, oftentimes uh, plants will grow a little bit differently in these because they're getting more sunlight than what they're used to. So other things that you need to be aware of. Um, Oh, about the commercial kits. If they come with a Velcro or a zipper door, you will be rebuilding that door uh, into something more conventional. Velcro or zipper doors in Wyoming last about 30 days. Um, <laughs> if you're if, lucky. If you're lucky. Uh, sand and grit will get into them and wear out the zipper. Uh, and Velcro just, uh, it just doesn't, I mean, it's a great product, but it's not intended for use in Wyoming for doorways. <laughs> it just doesn't hold up. Um, you know, on the flip side of that, we have plans uh, available from UW Extension for hoop houses and high tunnels. Uh, I also have a geodesic dome construction manual. It's in its draft version right now, um, but uh, it, it is available. You can contact me if you want something like that. Um, and I guess the last thing I'd like to say is that if anybody has any questions about these types of structures, I can help you work through it and, and um, help you extend your season, help you extend your growing season. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. You covered one of our, our questions or comments in our, in our, uh, that that was brought forward was how you know it'd be nice to have a another program about this of how to grow right of how to, construction ideas and methods but you just covered it we have those resources available right we've there's other videos talking specifically on the structures themselves not necessarily how to build them or that but considerations with them um so look those up uh, and you can also contact jeff brian and they will work you through the different structures and, and what to consider and think about for your own project. Well, and I am holding workshops this year for geodesic dome projects. So uh, we have a workshop coming up in Rollins, um, June 2nd and 3rd. Uh, so I pre-build the kit, the structure, and then on the 2nd, we'll, we'll build the framework of the dome. And then on the 3rd, we'll skin it. Uh, and so if folks are interested in that, contact the extension, con contact Abby Perry at the extension office in Rollins, um, and, uh, she'll save you a spot. Um, and then, uh, we have a really big project going on in Douglas this year. Um, and that the build date is in July, but I don't have the dates in my brain and I apologize for that. Uh, but we will be there one full week and we will be building four structures, uh, one at a local church, three at the fairgrounds, and those three we're doing a modified geo tunnel type structure. Uh, we're, building, we're building three contiguously and then I'm going to connect them. So it'll be, it'll be a long, it'll be a 60 foot long structure, uh, 23 feet wide, and then we'll connect them. Um, so, uh, something different, uh, it'll be something for us. Uh, and when I say us, it's myself and, uh, Ted Craig from the Wyoming department of ag, uh, we'll be trying to figure out how to get all that connected. And, you know, if people want to watch or participate, we'd appreciate it. Uh, but, uh, just give us a call and, and we'll let you know details. I, I was going to ask if you had those dates listed or workshops listed somewhere that like on a website or somewhere that people could look at. And, and if the answer is no, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Uh, the answer is no, but um, if you give me a, if you give me a minute, I can probably find the dates for the project in July. I was going to say Jeff can send them to me, and I'll stick them up on our barnyards and backyards Facebook okay. page, among other places. If you want, that'd be perfect. We'll work on that and put them up on the barnyards backyards website, so you can just refer to that as a one stop shop. Jenny wanted to mention, uh, so Jeff talked about 
if you want to build one of these structures, there's potential funding through the NRCS office. You need to go into your local uh, NRCS office and talk to them, see if they're still offering that program for one, but two, to see if you meet their requirements to, to get that funding. So you'll have to have more detailed conversations with your local NRCS office to look into that funding, but we highly encourage you to look into that. It would be of great benefit. Um, so we had a question come in. Oh, go ahead, Jeff, sorry. July 10th through the 14th is when we'll be in Douglas. And it'll be, a, the, the first build that we do will be at the church. I haven't gotten final details on that one, but then the, the other three remainder, the remainder of the week will be doing on the fairgrounds. Perfect. And we will try and get that up to the Barnyards and Backyards website so people know and know who to contact. So if they want to participate or, or watch anything that way. So the last uh, kind of comment question we had was Rick was asking about the literature on the plastic coverings that we said would gain temperatures using multiple layers. And so I, I don't believe we referenced any literature with that. It was just Jeff's experience with these projects where they they did some structures with a double layer of plastic. And if I remember what you said correctly, you need at a minimum of three inches to gain a benefit for having the two layers of plastic. That wasn't referencing actual literature. It was just practical experience that Jeff experienced. Well, we did do a little bit of a research project and uh, that was with um, Milt Geiger. Uh, and um, uh, it was published someplace, but I don't know where it's at now. <laughs> yeah, we did an article in, uh, the, in the magazine, so. Yeah. But I think you're referring to some of the other literature you'd looked up in the process. And so those were probably some papers from other universities across the nation, I expect. Yeah. yeah. So another question has just come in for Brian from Bailey. How tall do you want your low tunnels to be? You can do whatever size you want. The one behind me is close to six feet tall. Um, a lot of them I have are four feet tall. So um, you can kind of mix and match for whatever you need to do. So, um, you know, you can use a 10 foot piece of PVC uh, to make a shorter one or a 15 foot piece uh, to make a little bit taller one. So um, we have a design for a four foot one um, that's at Barnyards and Backyards uh, on the website, but um, you can kind of, you know, change the shape and size for that, um, you know, as you see fit. So um so that'd be like a four by eight um you know the 10 foot piece is about four foot tall maybe a little bit taller than that um one behind me is oh how wide is it i think it's like six feet wide um and so it ends up being about six feet tall so um, and, and you don't have to put that on a raised bed right brian you can do you can do low tunnels right in a traditional garden space yeah you can do them right there um I like using a two by six as kind of a base. So it is a little bit of a raised bed, but um, you don't have to. Um, Jenny, you know, who's on this, right? She she has one that's not on a, um, you know, frame or anything like that. And she's able to use it for her garden as well. So. Yep, and with those low tunnels, one of your big things you want to be doing is probably securing and anchoring that that covering, right? Brian, do you have any tips or tricks on that real quick? Yeah, um, I mean, for the high tunnels and the low tunnels, Jeff and I have used a product called Wiggle Wire, where there's a, a C channel, and then there's an actual, you can put your plastic into that channel, and then you can actually put a material, a wire material that holds it tight. Um, using my fingers is not the best description, but uh, if you go, if you just Google Wiggle Wire, um, you know, you can, you can see what that is, but that's a really good way to do that um, as well. So if you're in a windy place like Laramie, it's that's a good thing to have. So, yeah, One they also, the, oh, also sorry, I just want to mention they also sell the plastic kind of things that snap over the PVC. So they snap snap the covering onto the PVC. So they sell those. And then uh, personally, I just got some cheap um, plastic clips from Walmart probably and just stuck them on there. And they hold really well. If they hold up in Laramie, they're going to hold up in many other places. Binder clips. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go. Um, so one of the things we were kicking around, so we just did a workshop in Cheyenne this last weekend on uh, building a dome. And um, one of the things we were kicking around with that, the question was asked, okay, so how do you double plastic a dome? Well, 
do the traditional outside plastic and then you could plastic the inside because we use a front two by four frames right so it's only going to be two and a half inches but you would still get some insulative value and if you upgrade and you go to a frame that is uh, made out of uh, <laughs> not two by fours but two by sixes <laughs> you would definitely get that three inch uh, air wall uh, on a two by six. So if you skin the outside, skin the inside. And if you are going that route, you could skin the inside with traditional greenhouse film that would save some money. Um, but then you would be able to uh, have that air pillow on a dome. Mix and match and there's just more you can do, right? And it just keeps going up and, and yeah. customize it to what you want to do and how you need. And then the next level. So that's what I was just thinking. I was going to throw it out there as a joke of how tall does a low tunnel become before it becomes a high tunnel? <laughs> and you, it depends on the height of the person, right? It depends so on the height of the producer. It, it's now a high tunnel. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, but then it just keeps going and people want more and more and get you closer to a greenhouse structure, right? And yeah. so the next step possibly is ge you know, geothermal or a supplemental heat system. And how far you want to take it is totally up to you. Right. And, and how much you want to invest in it, right? And yep. the other thing too is it's gardening. There, there, people have failures gardening all the time. Be able to accept failure it, yep. and, and, and start over and the next year is a new canvas, right? Um, <laughs> and, and the opposite side of that is you might have some really incredible years of production and then not so much. So there's a whole lot of things that can happen and uh, uh, in in your growing strategies, my wife and I personally only like to grow the things we like to eat. Um, and so, you know, can I grow Brussels sprouts? I've tried it. I like Brussels sprouts. I am not a good Brussels sprouts grower. Uh, I'm willing to pay for Brussels sprouts in the grocery store. So um, it, it's a it, it's a big experiment, right? Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and then you got to figure out, well, well, how can I reproduce reproduce this consistently? Uh, and it's a combination of all these things. It's experience, right? Yeah. yeah. Yep. It's it's not a cookie cutter method. Perfect. The last question I have for you, Jeff, is humidity. So in our structures, we do increase our humidity. It can increase disease and pest issues, as you've mentioned. Do you worry about the humidity? You kind of referenced it in the wintertime, that humidity tends to go up in the structure. Do you worry about that? Do you manage that? What so, do you do? So you can, because humidity is higher, you can have things like white mold and those types of things show up. Um, if it does, I would recommend just pulling those plants and getting rid of them. Uh, you know, they're struggling. There isn't anything in the wintertime that you could probably do to make them better because the plants aren't actively growing to try to, if you have disease problems in the wintertime production, it's probably best to yank it and be done. Um, and remove it from the structure, right? And remove, remove it from the, the structure. The vector of the disease which is right. now the infected plant, get rid of it to protect the other plants if they don't have it. Right, and, and same thing if you have uh, insect problems in the wintertime, if you have isolated plants that have insects, pull them, get rid of them. Um, don't, don't let them, don't do nothing because <laughs> they will spread. Um, and and that's, that's how I manage a lot of pests in my uh, structure. If it's just one plant or a leaf that has insects on it, I'll pull those leaves and pitch them outside. Um, so, and, and I'll do that the last part of my time in the high tunnel so that I'm not spreading things to other plants. Perfect. I, I don't see any other questions. Do you, Brian? I don't, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think we can probably wrap up here and be done at 11. So. Um, so we really appreciate everybody tuning in today. Um, we appreciate the questions, the feedback. 
That's really great. Um, we do have an evaluation for this program. Um, Jenny will be sending out the information for that. So please uh, fill that out if you can. Um, it really helps us know where we're at, what's good, things we could maybe talk about different in the future, all those sorts of things. Um, so we'd really appreciate that. Um, this is the last one for the season. Um, so, you know, we appreciate everybody. I know I've seen some names on here uh, that have been at a lot of these other uh, live sessions. So we really appreciate your participation. So this is the last one for the season, um, but we will uh, update our website and things um, if we end up doing this in the future. Um, Jenny has up the Barnyards and Backyards website. So you can go here to the gardening uh, tab and on there we have a deal for season extension. So here you can find a lot of information um, talking about high tunnels, uh, low tunnels, things about pests. Um, we've got the, the you know, handouts and bulletins for construction and different things like that, which Jeff has done a great job. So if you have questions on that, check those out. Um, just really great resource. Um, as a reminder, we have, you know, University of Wyoming extension. Oh, and I should have mentioned that we have everything recorded. Um, so you can go back through and check out um, things that you have as far as, um, you know, questions about, you know, insect control inside these or another topic. Uh, these are all recorded. So you can send these to your friends. You can go to the YouTube link and, and check those out. So, um, so that's really great. Uh, we also have extension offices in every county and including the Wind River Indian Reservation. So um, if you have questions, you can always go to your local county. Um, but we are here throughout the state to help you as those things are. So uh, with that, we really appreciate you uh, joining us today and thank you. And uh, if you get a chance to fill out the evaluation, uh, we'd really appreciate it. So thank you, Jeff and Jeremiah and Jenny behind the scenes to make this all happen. Thank you.